Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for signing in to our webinar today on endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we will be calling EDCs. My name is Laurel Brzezanskis, and I am the Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals Policy Officer here at Healthcare Without Harm. We are honored to have with us today two amazing speakers. Uh, the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Tom Seller, who is a professor of biology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is currently focusing his research on environmental endocrine disruptors interference with thyroid hormone action in the developing brain. He's going to present some of his research and highlight some of the health concerns of EDCs. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Gavin Tintusha, who is a pediatrician at the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology at the West Fries Guest House in Horn, Netherlands. He specializes in pediatric pulmonology, allergies, and toxicology, and is currently heading up uh, one of the longest running ongoing pediatric health studies in the world. Dr. Tentisher will be giving you some guidance about where EDCs may be found in the hospitals and clinic settings, and uh, what kind of specific products you may recognize and how to phase them out. As I have uh, mentioned in my emails to you previously and in the chat function, um, please be sure and send your questions as they arise during the presentations, um, either through the question and answers box of the WebEx software. Uh, just make sure you choose all panelists from the drop-down menu to make sure that your questions come through to us. You can also send them um, through Twitter to HCWH Europe. And um, at the end, we will see, depending on how much time we have, we'll have a question and answer session. So I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Zeller. Well, good afternoon. Uh, so my goal here is to give kind of a brief summary of uh, and kind of an idea of what endocrine disruptors are and how exposure affects human health and how we can measure this. So first of all, some definitions. Now, there are a number of definitions of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Most of these you can see are given by regulatory agencies like the US EPA, European Union, the WHO, in each one of those cases, there's language in there that's a bit ambiguous. They talk about homeostasis, um, they talk about adverse effects that are, that are not uniformly uh, defined across countries as well as regulatory agencies within a company, uh, country. And also they talk about endocrine function. The Endocrine Society, in contrast, has developed a definition of endocrine disruptors that might be a little more intuitive, and that is that an endocrine disruptor is an exogenous chemical or mixture that interferes with hormone action. And interfere in this sense means that it triggers or blocks hormone action by some mechanism, any aspect in quotes, refers to interfering with the hormone receptor directly or with delivery of the hormone to the receptor. So this includes synthesis of the hormone transport, et cetera. And hormone action just means what the hormone does. This definition gets away from some ambiguity about whether or not a change in hormone levels in the blood represents endocrine disruption, and one of the examples of that is uh, a chocolate bar, that if you eat a chocolate bar, insulin levels will go up, and some people argue that this meets the definition of an endocrine disruptor, and of course, um, that doesn't make any sense. And from the endocrine point of view, an endocrine disruptor would be a chemical that interferes with the ability of insulin to, to act on target tissues when it's released or affects the release. Now, interestingly enough, bisphenol A has been shown to alter the responsiveness of beta cells at concentrations that are equivalent to estradiol uh, itself. So, 
So it's, in, it's important, first of all, to look at what hormones do and determine whether or not chemicals can interfere with that action. Now, obviously, to determine if a chemical has endocrine disrupting properties, you have to know what the, what the hormone is doing. And the problem is that hormones do different things at different places, meaning different tissues and at different developmental times. So endocrine disruptors have been shown, in fact, to interfere with hormone actions selectively. So it could be in the case of multiple receptor isoforms, some chemicals have a selective action on one isoform or another. Some chemicals can be metabolized uh, in a manner that activates their endocrine activity, and I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Um, and certainly, different endpoints of hormone action exhibit different um, exhibit different sensitivities to chemicals. So these are all important issues kind of in general. I want to give you an example kind of from our own work, and this is going to be a very quick survey of about 10 years of work. So first of all, PCDs, polychlorinated biphenyls, have been associated with cognitive deficits. And what I'm showing you here is a table from um, a major review that uh, was published in 2003, and you can see that almost all of these studies have documented some form of neurocognitive deficits. So the concept might be because some of these deficits, oops, sorry, some of these deficits are similar to that that would occur with a reduction in circulating levels of thyroid hormone. And so the hypothesis was, could PCB exposure be producing neurocognitive deficits by reducing circulating levels of thyroid hormone during development? Now, this is a, this is a simple concept, but the data don't support it. So there are a number of human studies evaluating the relationship between PCB exposure and circulating levels of thyroid hormone. And you can see that some of these studies demonstrate a relationship between serum T4, some with serum T3, few with serum TSH, and there's a rare concordance. One would expect if T4 levels decline, TSH should increase just because of negative feedback. But the data are not consistent with this hypothesis. And, and this is a problem in part because in animal studies, almost uniformly, PCB exposures have been shown to cause a reduction in circulating levels of thyroid hormone. So the animal studies where you can control this and, and certainly on a, per, on a daily dose uh, level, the, the amount of PCBs that people use are significantly greater than kind of the daily dose that humans would get, although the internal dose may not be that different. One of the things that you can see here is that, first of all, circulating levels of T4 increase during the first couple of weeks of rat development. This is uh, performed in rat pups. PCBs produce a decrease in circulating total T4, but also free T4. Now, one of the enigmas here is that serum TSH doesn't increase in response to these decreases in circulating levels of T4 and free T4, and that's true for several other types of chemicals. This enigma, really, we don't understand what the mechanism that could cause that, but I think that when we look at the animal studies, um, there's a disconnect between what we're seeing in terms of reduction in thyroid hormone levels and what we see downstream. Now, if, PCB, if PCBs cause a reduction in circulating levels of thyroid hormone, we should expect to see predictable changes in thyroid hormone action downstream. And if we look in the brain, what we find is kind of just the opposite. That is, <clears throat> as PCB concentrations 
increase, we see an increase in the expression of a gene that's known to be regulated directly by thyroid hormone. The, we've, got, we've got a significant amount of data on this. I'm just showing you one example. But the conclusion is that it's possible that some PCBs are acting as thyroid hormone receptor agonists. To evaluate this, we looked at three different classes of PCBs to determine whether or not they could activate the thyroid hormone receptor in a luciferase assay. This is just an in vitro assay that allows us to control the ability to see whether uh, a chemical could activate the thyroid hormone receptor directly. This wound up being a lot more complicated than we thought because what we find here if you look at the panel on the right at the beginning, at first here, what you see is that there are certain PCB congeners that can activate the thyroid hormone receptor, but only in the presence of PCB-126, which is a dioxin-like PCB. This suggests that there's metabolism occurring in this cell line that is causing these two PCB congeners, 105 and 118, to become activated with respect to the thyroid hormone receptor. And this is caused by an increase in the expression of the enzyme CYP1A1 that hydroxylates these parent PCB congeners. Now, this might seem kind of academic, but when we evaluated these same combinations of uh, PCB congeners, we see the same thing in a rodent model. And then we moved into a human system. So we've got essentially this hypothesis that coplanar PCBs, these dioxin-like PCBs, activate the expression of the enzyme CYP1A1, which then modifies specific PCB congeners to then activate the thyroid hormone receptor as evidenced by genes that are targets of the, of the TR. So in a human population, what we wanted to do is test whether CYP1A1 expression, and we looked at term placentas, would be correlated with the expression of thyroid hormone receptor targets. If that correlation occurs, it would really be the first evidence that endogenous, that uh, exogenous chemicals can interfere directly with thyroid hormone action in humans in a manner that's not predicted by thyroid hormone levels. So what we see here is that in a, in a cohort of about 134 placentas, we can see this relationship, a strong positive correlation between CYP1A1 expression and two thyroid hormone regulated genes. And these are uh, placental lactogen and growth hormone variant messenger RNAs. And these two messenger RNAs, interestingly enough, have an incredibly strong correlation with respect to each other. At the same time, we don't see a relationship between these genes, CYP1A1 uh, and cord blood free T4 uh, or total T4, as well as maternal free or total T4. So it's not T4 that's driving CYP1A1. In addition, in our study, there were 32 samples that had undetectable levels of CYP1A1. So what we find in this case is that in those samples that had that were CYP1A1 negative, we found a correlation between growth hormone variant and placental lactogen and cord blood uh, T4. In addition, these two genes, again, even in this small sample, were tightly correlated with each other. We've also now extended this to second trimester placentas, and we see none of these relationships as well as liver. Uh, we see none of the relationships between CYP1A1 and the expression of growth hormone variant or placental lactogen or a correlation between these two thyroid hormone targets. 
we're not really sure what to make out of the second uh, observation, except that there's going to be a temporally specific uh, relationship, probably between thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone regulated genes, but also the impact of chemicals on that. So the conclusions here are that animal studies demonstrate that some endocrine disruptors can interfere with thyroid hormone action in tissues, for example, in the developing brain, in a manner that's not reflected by changes in thyroid hormone levels uh, in serum. Human studies identify associations between toxic and exposures and functionality that might be an index of thyroid disruption, but the relationship with hormone levels in the blood have been inconsistent. We're really, I think one of the challenges in this field is, and I think clinically as well, irrespective of endocrine disruptors, is that we need to capture um, measures of hormone action in tissues that are that are that we're capable of getting uh, in a human population. So we might think about white blood cells circulating monocytes as well as placenta, maybe even fibroblasts, uh, to capture measures of thyroid hormone action that might be more predictive of health effects than hormone levels in the blood. So this, this uh, quote here, we live in a chemical soup, actually came from Linda Birnbaum, <clears throat> who was making the point that correlating the health effects of chemical exposure um, is going to be very difficult because everyone is exposed to chemicals and we're all exposed to many chemicals. These chemicals have many different kinds of chemistries as well as coming from many different places in the body. We think about the low dose effect. That is, uh, a part per billion seems infinitesimally small, one drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Hormones actually act in the part per billion or part per trillion range, so it's not unheard of. That's the first issue. The second thing is that there are many different kinds of chemicals that can interact with the same endocrine system at different points of regulation. We don't have a lot of information about this. And this is something that we really need to work on. Finally, I think the most vulnerable time for exposure, and this comes perhaps from the perspective of uh, somebody who works on thyroid hormone and brain development, but what we've found is that, uh, is that the fetus is exposed to a large number of chemicals. In the United States, at least, we're talking about 100 chemicals or so in each cord blood sample. Uh, this is an incredible stressor. And while we may not know that all of these chemicals are bad or that we know that some of them have an impact because we can measure uh, uh, you know, we can measure relationships between exposure, but because everyone is exposed, it's going to be a difficult concept to prove, and we need to focus on mechanistic studies as well. So I think I'll stop there and leave it for the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeller. Again, if uh, any questions have come up, please send them through the Q&A function or via Twitter to HCWH Europe. And I will now pass the floor to Dr. Ten Tischer. Everyone, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the organizers, especially to Laurel, for uh, organizing. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, be able to share some ideas with you today and to enter the discussion. Um, when, um, when we talk about the endocrine disruptors, as Dr. Zellis has spoken about, um, we need to consider that um, the most vulnerable, vulnerable you know, part of our, uh, 
of our population, are the very sick, the very ill, uh, the very small. But what's also important is um, that although we try to to treat these children and to to, to, uh, to bring them back to good health, um, we need to remember that healthcare is also an important source of environmental exposure, but also chemical exposure to the very sick and the very small and the very young. And while healthcare is certainly not the most important source, it does certainly play a big role. And if you look at the exposure within hospitals, within the healthcare, then there's, an expo there's some exposures that of course are beyond our control, if you think about the air we breathe in, um, the water we drink. But certain exposures are also um, without our, outside of our control, if you think about the exposure that a child gets through breastfeeding. But there are exposures that we can get a grip on, and that especially in the medical devices and the medical um, equipment that we use. If we look at uh, what are the most at risk, you're looking at the very small, the very premature babies, um, but you're also looking at the very sick children. And these are children that in general are in hospitals for a long period of time, that have lots of exposure to, um, to, to uh, plastics, and what the problem is that their body compositions are different to, the, to that of us as adults. They have a, have a higher fat to water ratio, um, but in total they've got less body fat, which means that it's more difficult for them to package to um, the exposures that they're getting of especially chemicals that, um, that, that are uh, lipophilic, it's like to be in a, in a fatty environment. And we mustn't forget that this is the, right at the beginning of their life. They're going to be exposed to chemicals for the rest of their lives. But, as Dr. Zella already uh, mentioned, they've also got organs that are developing, like their brain and like their reproductive organs. And what we know is that an exposure on developing organs um, has a greater impact than that of an acute exposure in the body. Well, DHP is probably the most studied of the, of the phthalates, of the softness, the plasticizers within plastic that we use in healthcare. Um, as everybody knows, uh, plastics are something that we, that's not um, that's totally a uh, normal part of everyday life. But the problem with plastics, most plastics these days are made of PVC, because it's cheap, it's easy to make. And the problem with the PVC is very, uh, very rigid, very hard. In order to make it soft, pliable, flexible for um, healthcare use and also for other uses, we add um, softeners or plasticizers. Um, DHP is probably one of uh, the most used uh, traditionally. But we also know that DHP doesn't make, or the planets don't, don't form a very strong bond with the plastics, which means that it leaches out very easily. And we've known that for decades. We've also known that it leaches out of um, everyday uh, medical devices that we use. Um, if you look at um, everything from nasogastric tubes to um, peritoneal uh, systems to um, all sorts of things that we're using on a daily basis. And we've also known for a long time that there's probably a very um, high risk of an effect, negative health effect on the developing fetus but also on endocrine disruption. disruption. In other words, that our hormone systems in our body get changed, get, get uh, influenced. I won't um, talk a lot about the scientific background of this next, but Dr. Zellers, of course, uh, spoke much about that. But there are a couple of items that are quite important to bear in mind. One of them is that uh, DHP is something that is, is life of belief. In other words, it um, chooses to, it, it, it's more easily found in a fatty environment than in a water-based environment. Um, blood is water-based. Uh, your, your cell membranes the, the, the surrounding every cell in your body is, like a, it's, it's made of uh, fat. Um, but we also know that uh, anything with, uh, that, that binds to fat that's easily found in fat, easily passes to the center and is easily found in breast milk. Breast milk contains about two and a half to three and a half percent fat. Now, I think it's probably very important at this moment to emphasize that this is certainly not a call to stop breastfeeding. Breast milk is still the absolute best way to feed a child, and we advocate breastfeeding and breast milk. Um, but the chemicals we're talking about shouldn't be in breast milk. 
and there's nothing the mother can do about it, but it's something we can, uh, as, as a society, do something about. Anyway, the child um, gets the exposure to the phthalates, but then we've got a couple more problems in the, bo in the body of a young child. One of them is that um, the most important enzyme necessary to, to detoxify the uh, DHP, the pancreatic lipase, is found in much lower concentrations in neonates, newborns, than in old children and in adults. And furthermore, we know that the gut absorption of uh, DHP is far higher in neonates. So we've got an exposure, they're absorbing chemicals far better from their gut, and they're having more problems detoxifying, whereby the exposures are greater. And as already mentioned, we have to deal, we have to remember that they've got important developmental windows. A few studies, um, one study con uh, conducted on the neonatal intensive care unit, where they looked at six um, premature born infants that were expected to have an intravenous infusion for at least two weeks. Uh, urine examples were, uh, urine samples were collected from the infant, and uh, the metabolites of EHP were determined by the Center for Disease and Control. What you see is that the birth weight of the children is very low, these are very small babies, and you see that gestational age um, is also very small. So these are very sick, very ill children, children that uh, have a high risk of uh, serious disabilities, but also of dying. And then if you look at the results that came out, what you see straight away is that in the neonates, the exposures were far higher than in uh, children and in adults uh, in the general population. And that's for all three of the uh, metabolites. But what's also important is to look at the scale at the bottom of the graph. And what you see is that it's not a uh, linear scale, it's a, it's a logarithmic scale. So in other words, you're looking at tenfold and hundredfold um, increases in exposure. The authors um, found that the exposure for the neonates was about 26 times higher than for all the children or for the, for the general population in the U.S. And so we, and, and we know generally that, that exposure in children is always higher than that of uh, adults. But then you're looking at one to two orders of magnitude higher in these newborns, which means 10 to 100 times the exposures. Another study looked at uh, 84 uh, births, consecutive births, in a general practice hospital where the expectation that you don't have excessive amounts of uh, pathology. And that's, you can see that 11 preterm babies, three very small for gestational age, small for gestational age. And um, that's pretty much uh, what you've seen in general practice hospital. And what the um, what the researchers did do is they looked at the, um, the pregnancy duration, so the gestational age. And what they found was that there was an inverse correlation, an inverse relationship with the MEHP. In other words, the higher the exposure, the shorter the pregnancy duration. Now, um, for, for term babies, uh, one and a half weeks different is really not, really not uh, important. In fact, uh, most mothers will probably be happy to. Uh, uh, Get uh, get rid of uh, go through the uh, get rid of all the, the extra baggage one and a half weeks earlier. But for children that are born prematurely, that makes a big difference. A child born at 28 weeks has a far higher risk of mortality mm -hmm. and serious morbidity than a child born at 30 weeks or at 32 weeks. We also know that um, sometimes children are so ill. That, we, that they aren't able to uh, breathe by themselves, that we have to ventilate them. And then what we do is we bring in a, a plastic tube, an uh, intubation uh, tube, bring them through the airway, into the airway, through the nose or through the mouth, and we ventilate the child with a machine. Well, what we know is that if you, vent if you use an intubation tube that's made of PVC with DHP, you have about a 10% loss of the DHP during use. And that, of course, can only go one way. First of all, we know that if you, sometimes these children are so ill that, that, that they cannot even ventilate them 
successfully with the artificial ventilation of the lungs, that we have to oxygenate um, the blood and basically go into a heart lung machine, not so much the heart as uh, um, the bypass machine whereby your, you know, the blood gets saturated with uh, oxygen. That's called ECMO. So those are the really, really ill children. And we know that if you, if you put saline, it's a normal saline solution through the uh, circuits, that you have an increased uh, degradation, an increase uh, of the DHP that's getting used. We also know from various studies that um, infants that have no DHP, um, you know, that you know, they, they cannot find DHP, uh, you give them one blood transfusion and suddenly you've got a high exposure that you can really determine. And that, of course, comes from the packaging of the, and the and systems from the blood transfusion. Various uh, studies have shown that DHP can be found in the lung tissue, an autopsy of the uh, uh, neonates within uh, practically to invade it within uh, ventilated cancer. In other words, it is exposure. Now, if you look at a, you know, the normal da daily exposure that you and I will have on a daily basis, that's between 3 and 30 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. Some Sometimes these children, that's often the case, these children are so ill that they are and so small, so weak, that they're not able to feed themselves. And so that we have to um, give them nutrition via a nasogastric tube, a special plastic tube that bring them through the nose into the stomach. And, um, and when we feed them through that, you can also give medications over the nasogastric tube. But if you're using a major gastric tube that contains DHP, you're certainly increasing exposure by a tenfold. In other words, you are, the exposure that you and I have on a daily basis, well, take 10 of those days and you're giving that to these babies every day. But some of these children are so ill um, that you cannot feed them via the, the um, gastrointestinal tract. Um, and that we have to feed them via the, the intravenous transfusions via um, the bloodstream. And if you do that with the, um, with the system that, that contains DHP, you're giving a thousand fold concentration every day. That means that the exposure that you and I are having in three years, we're giving every day. We know that the exposure in children is always higher than that of adults. And we know that um, DHP has been shown to be toxic um, in animals. We presume it to be toxic in humans. Um, it's difficult to be to show uh, very concretely because of it, because of the long um, exposure, uh, long, long terms of, of uh, the studies, but also because it's very difficult. You can, it's not ethical to, to inject somebody with DHP and see what the outcome is. But you mustn't forget that DHP exposure is something that these children will have lifelong. That's not something that's just for now and then finished. In, um, at the end of uh, last century, 1999, in the EU, the European Union passed a law banning all uh, DHP in, in, uh, uh, in toys for children from the age of three. And the reason they did well that is because from the age of three, children tend to put everything into their mouths. And we know, and that obviously the law makers also knew that, that the DHP then leaches out and enters the gastrointestinal tract of children. The US Food and Drug Administration um, uh, have stipulated that uh, neonate intensive care unit patients are at particular risk. And the American Medical Association adopted a policy some years ago whereby they gave an advice um, to um, healthcare to move away, to phase out polyvinyl chloride, PVC for medical devices, and especially PVC con um, uh, devices containing BHP. So we, um, we, we, have, uh, yeah, we have a call here from the American Medical Association to step over, to change over to better alternatives. If we summarize up to now, clear indications of exposure, for medical devices in healthcare, despite that we're trying to do good. We know that the chance is very high that the negative, negative health effects. These children live in a plastic-laden environment, you and I also, and the exposure 
is high. Which means that we then need to think about looking for safer alternatives. And at this moment in time, there are safer alternatives available for almost all the products that we're using in healthcare. But it means that we have to actively choose the better alternatives. We need to choose DHP free, PVC free, and um, maybe bear in mind, when in doubt, throw it out. Well, at our hospital, we did that. We started a few years ago, and we opened every cupboard, every drawer, and we made a list of every single product that we used. And we uh, set up a database. Um, at the time, it was very difficult to see what products contained PVC, DHP, and which didn't. These days, certainly in Europe, it needs to be uh, stipulated on the packaging. But that, in, at the time, that wasn't yet uh, the case. Um, for the products where we didn't know, we uh, inquired of our power suppliers. Mostly the suppliers didn't know either, and they referred us back to the importers. The importers obviously uh, often also had no idea. And uh, eventually, the, the questions were often sent all the way back to producers. So sometimes it took months to get an answer. But what we eventually did was all the products when, um, where it was uh, determined that it was PVT or DHDM, we, st we started to phase out and replace with better alternatives. At this stage, we've uh, basically phased out uh, almost everything. It's very difficult to be completely PVC free because you um, uh, yeah, have also PVC in, in, uh, in the ceiling, in the, in the walls, in the, in the machines that you use. We're busy building a new hospital at the moment, and we've stipulated in the hospital and in the pediatric department, in you know, the college department, that we know PVC. So even though we are trying to take it a step further. Well, as I said, sometimes it's quite easy to see um, if something contains PVC or DHP or not. This is a part of an, an intravenous infusion system, connector, and um, you, you can see quite clearly it says no DHP. That's great. That's uh, something we would we use this from that, one of our cupboards. We also have other products where it's more difficult to see. Um, especially for people that aren't trained in, uh, in, in science or in, in uh, chemicals. And that's uh, just about everybody in, uh, in the hospital. Well, this is a, um, a, a nasal, an ox an, an, an oxygen therapy annual, um, the, which is attached under the nose of the child and with oxygen air through it. But what you see is that this particular may as THT um, or phthalates, and furthermore, there's DHPN. Here's another example. This is a, uh, an, also an infusion system that you connect to an infusion uh, sack with, the, with the, the liquid that you'd like to infuse the patient with, and you connect it up to the cannula that's in the, in the arm or wherever, in the vein. Um, once again, you see here that this one also contains phthalate, THT. This is another variation of an intravenous line. This is something that we often use uh, within pediatrics because, as you can see, that spiral is very handy for the, especially the young children. They want to move around and play and run around. And uh, you have these infusion systems that otherwise uh, don't last too long. So this is offers some great uh, opportunity for the children to be able to play. However, you need to let, you need to look at what the composition is. Now, as you see, this one is made of polyethylene. This is uh, one from, uh, from our wards. And this is uh, a better alternative to something containing DHP. But also, it's not only things that you, to, to, you, you, you um, administering fluids to a child or medicine to a child, but this is something that just measures the oxygen level so from the outside of the child, around the thumb or the toe or the hand or something. And what it measures is the oxygen content of, it, of the blood. And what you see is that this one contains DHP, also based on the phthalate in it. This is a nasogastric tube. As I mentioned earlier, that you use for feeding a child over the, over the stomach, children that are very ill. 
And um, what you see is that on almost all medical products these days, it's very easy to see that you've got a CE um, code on it. Um, CE for Europeans, that's really uh, it's, it's allowed for use. Uh, it's a certain quality control. Yeah, and almost always you see quite clearly whether there's latex involved or not. But what's more difficult, and of course it's sterile, but what's more difficult is to see if it's DHP or PVC um, in the system. Now, this one is, uh, it, is based on the polyurethane, PUR. But of course, your average nurse or your average uh, um, buyer won't, won't know what that means. So it's something that we have to actively uh, give instructions to the buying department. Hey, that's something to watch for. So we choose better alternatives. So to bring it all together, I, I cannot emphasize enough the fact that our children are being exposed to chemicals and, and that these concentrations are too high. And what we're doing at this stage is we're risking the health and development. We're risking the future of our children, their children, and of society in general. And the thing I'd like to um, leave you with is uh, to employ you to let's learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past. As physicians, we all take an oath, and one of the items in the oath is that we, we uh, promise to first do no harm. And while we're treating our patients, let's bear this in mind, and let's make an active choice to uh, choose better alternatives. And it's not impossible, it's just an active choice that we have to make. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tentisha. Before we start the question and answer session, um, I just wanted to bring to your attention the fact that Healthcare Without Harm Europe has put together a database um, called the Safer Medical Devices Database. And this is a tool that procurers from hospitals can use to search for medical products and devices that are PVC and or phthalates free. Um, the website is located at safermedicaldevices.org, and uh, procurers can search by product category, like uh, intravenous products, uh, by manufacturer or by country, to locate safer alternatives to products and devices that contain PVC and phthalates. We are always updating our site with new products, and um, we are currently expanding to include BPA-free products. So if you want to check that out, again, it's safermedicaldevices.org. Um, also, if you want more information about EDCs in the health sector, you can find on the Healthcare Without Harm Europe webpage a leaflet that we put together last year for health professionals called Endocrine Disruptors in the Health Sector. And this is kind of a handy leaflet that you could use to educate your coworkers and others about EDCs. Here's a um, list of the links for you. Um, just also would like to bring to your attention that the European Commission will shortly begin a public consultation on EDCs, and I would really encourage all of you to submit a response um, for this important issue. If you uh, would like to know more about it, you can just email me, Laurel, um, or you can check out the EDCs Free campaign page, which is edc-free-europe.org. And uh, last thing before we start our question and answer session, um, Healthcare Without Harm has created a network of global green and healthy hospitals, which we call GGHH. This is a worldwide community of hospitals, health systems, and organizations that are dedicated to reducing their ecological footprint and are dedicated to promoting the environmental and public health in their communities. Membership is free, and you can get a variety of benefits um, such as uh, access to the social media platform called GGHH Connect, uh, guidance documents and expert advice on um, how to make your hospital more sustainable. Um, in return, um, the members will promise to endorse the GGHH agenda, which includes um, pharmaceuticals issues, chemicals, purchasing, and commit themselves to implement and involve um, the agenda by tracking their progress and um, achieving measurable 
output. Uh, if you were interested in that, please check out greenhospitals.net. Now we can start our question and answer session. The first question that we have come in is, uh, will the slides be made available? Yes, we will put the slides on our website after the webinar. Uh, our website is noharm-europe.org. The second question is coming for uh, Dr. Tim Tischer, and it is, are nurses or workers also exposed to EDCs? Yes, it's certainly the case. We're all exposed on a daily basis, um, but you can imagine that workers and uh, nurses that work with the equipment are also having extra exposure. I'm not aware of any studies that have been done in hospital settings looking at uh, exposure through, through skin and through touching. Uh, um, I'm not sure that, if, I don't, I, as far as I know, there may be no studies done on that uh, level. But of course, there have been very many studies performed on uh, in industrial environments for the production of um, a lot of the substances we've talked about. Um, but there certainly there is exposure. Thank you. Our next question is, what kind of chemicals are EDCs? You mentioned DEHP. Can you name a few other substances? And I guess this would be going also to uh, Dr. Tintisha. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of uh, different chemicals that fall under EDC. Um, dioxins is also a very well-known uh, example. Dioxins also influence uh, hormones at uh, or, or the hormone systems um, at concentrations that are equivalent to, to the hormones in your body. Um, uh, you've got uh, BVA, bisphenol A, uh, which is known from the, the baby bottles. Um, you've got uh, um, all sorts of, of estrogen compounds that are used in, uh, in, uh, in packaging, for instance, or in um, various products. There, there are lots and lots of EDCs in, uh, that we, we're confronted with in a daily basis. If I could expand on that uh, just a little bit, this is Tom Zeller. <clears throat> there's, um, there's a couple of lists that are being maintained by different groups. One group I think that has put together a very competent list is uh, TEDx. It's called the Endocrine Disruptor Exchange, and it has um, a URL of TEDx.org. <clears throat> there are probably, I think they list about a thousand endocrine disruptors, but, may, but many of those are classes of chemicals. For example, and I think this is probably true in the healthcare system, uh, at least in the U.S., there are many flame retardants that are used on a variety of office furniture as well as bedding. Those, uh, those flame retardants represent classes of chemicals that can be estrogenic as well as anti-androgenic as well as affect the thyroid system and perhaps other nuclear receptors as well that could be important, especially during development. Uh, so there are a variety of chemistries uh, that that wind up having endocrine activity. Perfluorinated chemicals, I think, are another that's uh, important. Uh, many of these can be found even associated with, with different foods, especially fatty foods. Perchlorate is one that I think should become interesting. There's a new paper that was, um, that's coming out in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism that was performed in Europe, and uh, they're showing a relationship between perchlorate, which reduces iodine uptake and cognitive function in offspring. So, so these are a number of different chemicals, and um, I think that there, there's good lists out there and ways of of reducing your exposure. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we actually just got a message from one of our participants um, who would love to give an update to you all. Uh, she is working on the PVC free blood brag project and um, she would uh, like to give you an update on that. I will just pass her the floor. 
Uh, yes, Lena Stig, I'm the project manager of the PBC Free Blood Bag project. And I was just wanted to tell you that we we now have a prototype that is ready to be evaluated. And the evaluation will start in January. And this uh, um, prototype bag is completely PVC free. So I just wanted to tell you some good news. Thank you so much. We have one last question for our two speakers. And this is, are there specific precautions that pregnant women should take to avoid exposure? And I will pass this um, actually to either one of you. Um, Tom, uh, would you like to ask first? There, there, uh, certainly, there's certainly uh, precautions that a pregnant woman can take. Would you like to answer first, Tom, that I follow sure. you? Sure, I can go ahead. I think the first thing, especially from a thyroid perspective, and especially for pregnant women, I would always first encourage people to think about their iodine uptake because uh, thyroid health is really important during pregnancy and, and many people uh, have diminished iodine uptake or iodine uh, dietary consumption without really knowing it. So I think that that's something positive that you can do. I think also avoiding plastics, avoiding plastics in microwave, et cetera, as well as a lot of processed food uh, can diminish, as well as canned food, can diminish uh, a number of EDC exposures. I think at the end of the day, there, there are a number of exposures that are going to be difficult to control or to really even know about. But, um, but I wanted to make a pitch for iodine first, just because it's, uh, it's, an important, it's an important issue that oftentimes is overlooked, and I'll pass it on to Gavin. Yeah, thanks. Um, what Tom already said, that the most important things for pregnant women, the practical things that you can do. You know, a lot, a lot of the exposure we, we cannot, um, uh, we cannot prevent as individuals. As society, we can not as, as individuals. But a lot of the practical things, practical advice that we give to a pregnant woman that come with the same question is, um, as Tom said, don't heat up her food in plastic. Um, don't, don't put plastic in the microwave. Don't. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, put it in something else if you're going to heat something, you heat your food up. Um, with the, the packaging that's around the food, the ready-made meals, um, a lot of the packaging contains uh, uh, BPA, bisphenol A, um, which is an, in fact an estrogen, um, it was developed as an estrogen. Um, so that it's not wise. You can rather than choose something that has a different kind of packaging. Um, there's uh, um, what, what's wise is to also look at um, where your products are grown, whether it's, you know, whether, whether there's been lots of uh, use of insecticides and uh, um, things like that, chemicals in, in, the, in the agricultural sector, or whether something that's more been uh, biologically processed obviously uh, has less chemicals or should have less chemicals. Um, you can uh, look at the, the, um, in, in the the drinking uh, of liquids. A lot of the um, a lot of the bottles we use uh, are also plastic, and not all the plastic is uh, is plastic that's acceptable um, in this sense. Um, if you if you if you're using uh, bottled uh, water or bottled drinks, um, it's probably good to to check that that's also that's that the, the bottles aren't made of PVC or of uh, DHP or other phthalates in. Um, and so it's a lot of the practical issues that you can do. You know, there are also other things like um, what's quite general. Uh, we always laugh, I think, uh, as a man, I'm probably not allowed to say that, but um, women do have a nesting feeling somewhere during pregnancy. And what most women want to do is they want to make the house nice and clean and tidy, um, and, but they also want to paint this and do that. And a lot of the paints have also got chemical in them, aren't, aren't really good for pregnancy, or not good for the fetus. 
Um, it's just, you know, the question is, if it's wise to do that, or where, where does your bank uh, get somebody else to do the same thing for you? So that, those are kind of, those are a lot of practical things. Um, in um, Denmark, the, the Danish Health Authority brought out a very practical uh, guide that they present to uh, make available to pregnant women. At our hospital, we, our uh, gynecologists um, brought out something similar based on, on the, the Danish uh, uh, literature. Um, and that's probably very easy to download on the internet. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. And I thank all of you for joining our webinar today. Shortly, we will circulate an email containing the, all the links of the programs I mentioned and a recording of today's events. I wish you all a pleasant week. And uh, thanks again from Healthcare Without Harm.